Words of Joy and Hope. It is the sixth Sunday of Easter, the year C. Gospel of John, chapter 14, 23, 29, and the commentary by Father Fernando Armelini. Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Yet the word you hear is not mine, but that of the Father who sent me. I have told you this while I am with you. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. Peace I give with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. You heard me tell you, I am going away and I will come back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. A good Easter to all. The text that we have just heard must be placed in the context which is the discourse that Jesus did during the Last Supper. It is his will, it is his testament. The last sacred words he pronounced and the message he leaves to his disciples. Before today's text, the evangelist mentioned some questions placed by the disciples these are the same questions we would like to ask Jesus before he leaves this world. We begin with Peter. He asks Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Jesus had said that he was about to leave them. And Jesus answers Peter, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. And Peter asks him, why cannot I not follow you now? And Jesus pronounces the prophecy of Peter's denial. Then it is Thomas who intervenes when Jesus says, Where I am going, you know the way. And Thomas, who is a very practical man, says, We do not know where you are going. How do we get to know the way? Jesus is talking about the fact that he is about to leave this world. And there is a path that leads him to the house of the Father, to glory, to glorification. Therefore, the judgment that Jesus pronounces on his life will be viewed by the world as a defeat, according to people. But what really counts is what the Father says about his life. Jesus is talking about the way, and Thomas wants to know where Jesus is going. How can we can have a vague idea about the way? And Jesus answers, I am the way. Then it is Philip who intervenes when Jesus says, You know the Father. And Philip says, We do not know him. Show us the Father, and this will be enough for us. And Jesus answers, Philip, He who has seen me has seen the Father. These are all questions that uh, touch us deeply because especially the last one of Philip, uh, Jesus says that if we want to know the face of the Father in heaven, we have only one way, that is contemplating the perfect reflection of the face of the Father in the face of Jesus. Contemplating Jesus, we see the Father. Then Jesus continues talking with Philip and the last sentence that Jesus pronounces, responding to Philip, is 
how the text of today's Gospels begins. Whoever loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. The word love appears four times. The Greek verb is agapan, which is the typical love of Jesus. This verb was not common in classical Greek literature. It was uh, very little used. It indicates unconditional, free-giving love that expects nothing in return. And Jesus appropriates this love. It is the only time Jesus has to be loved. Whoever loves me. For us, this expression can be misunderstood because it could seem like a request of someone who wants to chain effectively the other person, perhaps serving him or her for his own selfish desires, and keep this person, him or her, while it interests him, and then leaves them when he's no longer interested in them. Beginning, be, begging to be loved would be, could be an egoistic call for us. But this is not the meaning of the request that Jesus makes. Whoever loves me means, if you want to join your life to mine. This is what happens in the spousal relationship between husband and wife. They are two people who have a unique project. They are in full and perfect harmony. This is what Jesus means by love. Whoever loves me, that is, if one wants to join his life to mine, there is a way, and it is to observe my commandments. And here it does not refer to the commandments of Moses. My commandments is actually a single commandment, that of love. And he says it in the plural because there are many manifestations and situations where this commandment is concretized, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to give drink to the thirsty, to receive at home the one who has no roof, etc. But it is always a single commandment, that of love. Whoever loves me, that is, if one wants to join his life to mine, there is only one way, accept as my rule of life, my commandments, love. This love manifests itself to those who allow themselves to be involved in this relationship of union, of life with Jesus. Only those who enter into this relationship of love with Jesus can see the manifestation of his face. And now a fourth disciple intervenes, Jude. The name Jude, Judas, was very common in Jesus' time. Let's just remember that one of the brothers of Jesus was called Jude. Jesus asked him, How is it that you manifest to us and not to the world? Jude seems disappointed. He wanted Jesus to manifest himself to the world in all his glory. And Jesus says, I can only manifest myself to those who enter into this relationship of love with me. In John's way of speaking on the fourth gospel, the word world represents a conception of life which is the opposite of what the Master proposes. The world presents a successful life to those who can enjoy thinking of themselves, retreating over their own interests. The proposal Jesus makes is that of love, forgetting oneself to give life to others. 
there cannot be a bigger opposition between Jesus and the world. Jesus says that he cannot show himself to the world, to those who make an option that is not that of love. This is Jesus' answer to Jude. If someone loves me, he will keep my word. Therefore, Jesus says that to love is to get in tune with his life, as the life, as the wife with the husband accepting his proposal. And he continues saying, My father will love him. Therefore, this relationship of love with Jesus enters in full harmony with what is the father's love, the father who is love. That is, one comes wrapped in this life of the Father because God is love, and who enters into harmony with the love of Jesus is also in attuned with the love of the Father, in communion with God. Then Jesus says, Whoever receives this love, whoever loves me, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. What does this mean? We have felt many times that we are the temple of God, the place of his presence. We should not imagine that we become an urn in which the Trinity comes and abides inside us. What does this dwelling mean? Every encounter with God leaves evident signs of the presence of the Spirit, of the God of life, the life of God, in man, in people, the divine that is in us, when we let in, in, when we let this divine be expressed, has external manifestations. If we welcome this divine life and get in tune with the love of Jesus, this presence of the divine in us is manifested in every expression of our life of our person. Now our way of speaking will be in tune with the love of God. It will be the manifestation of this life, of this love. We become someone totally different from who instead lets himself be guided by the impulses that are those of the world. And by world is meant the opposition to this life of love. This is the reason why the revelation, the manifestation of Jesus can only happen in the disciple who welcomes his word. Jesus promised to stay always with us. We have many manifestations of his real presence. The real presence in the Eucharist, undoubtedly. But also the other presences of Jesus are real his presence in the poor. He said it himself, he who receives a poor receives me. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. It is a real presence, indistinct from the others. Therefore, even before the Eucharistic celebration is celebrated, Jesus is present in the community that meets, gets together, prays, and listens to his word. And there is also another presence that touches us vividly, the presence in every disciple who loves. <clears throat> People have the right to see the face, the presence of Jesus, the manifestation of the presence of the Son of God in every disciple. When the disciple loves, his words are those of Jesus. They are in tune with those of the Father. His thoughts are those of Jesus. His smile is that is the smile of Jesus. His actions are those of Jesus. The way of life is that of Jesus because we are moved internally by the presence of this Spirit <clears throat> that is love, the life of the Father of Heaven. Then we have the promise of the Comforter, of the Paraclete. Jesus has just said in chapter 14 in the Gospel of uh, John, 
the father will give you another paraclete, another comforter, as the Greek term paraclete is translated. I will not leave you orphans. Jesus was the paraclete. Paracletos means the one next to you. When Jesus was in this world, he was the paraclete. He was next to the disciples. Now that Jesus is leaving this world, he sends another paraclete, which is the Spirit, placed next to. Paraclete is not a name of the Holy Spirit, but the presentation of the function that the Spirit has. The divine life that Jesus brought to the world, who has communicated to all. How does this paraclete act? First of all, being by our side. The paraclete has been communicated to all. How does the paraclete act? We have the need to see someone at our side. <clears throat> in former times, everyone was baptized. People went to church. They reacted in a certain way according to what was preached to them in, by the catechist in the church. And they had no problems because everyone believed in the same way. They tried to practice the same guidelines of the gospel. But today, it is not like that. Today we see clearly that those who want to follow Christ must do so consciously, very convinced. And many times, they feel alone. <clears throat> they feel that they go against the tide because everyone goes on the opposite, in the opposite direction. This is one of the most difficult tests of our faith, the feeling of isolation in the midst of a world that reacts and works according to criteria very different from ours. And continuing when you are alone is very difficult because the doubt always appears since everyone is going in the opposite direction. Will not be I the one who mistakes the way? Think, for example, of forgiveness, love of enemies, meekness, self-control, altruism, chastity, unconditional conjugal love, project to build a family, talking about eternal life when everyone is focused on the reality of this world. The one who behaves this way is someone who lives in another world. And maybe someone may comment, <clears throat> but you, in what world do you live? It is in this situation when one feels the loneliness and the need to have someone by the side. <clears throat> to walk with him. In these situations, we hear inside us a voice that tells us, this is the way, go on, continue. This is the voice of the paraclete. We all have the experience from an inner voice that tells us, this is the way, it is worthwhile to follow the proposal made by Jesus of Nazareth. You might be considered a retrograde, a medieval, an obscurantist. Behaviors that can be very strange for other people. It is the moment when we must pay attention to the inner voice, that of the paraclete. It is he who is by our side. <clears throat> Let us give some examples to better understand what Jesus tells us. Take, uh, let's take, for example, a young man who lives his sexuality according to certain Christian values that are different from his peers. He can feel lonely and doubt his behavior and that he too should think about himself and live as everyone else does. At that moment, he feels an inner voice that says, Jesus is right. You have chosen well. Listen to the word of God. And this is the voice of the Spirit. 
if that same young man on a Saturday night goes not does not think about partying but participates in serious meetings and reaching himself to deepen his faith, he may have also the doubt those who are going to have fun, those who enjoy life. But at that moment he feels a voice inside him that says, your choice is the right one because it is the behavior that Jesus proposes to you. That is the voice of the Spirit, of the Paraclete, who is by your side. And if on a Sunday morning he gets up early to participate in the community meeting and even offers himself to animate the community, and he does not get up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon all stunned, he can also feel lonely. At that moment he feels a voice that says, what you do is fine. Your options are life options. This is the voice of the paraclete. Therefore, you are not alone. The paraclete is by your side. The text goes on on saying that he will be your defender. Paraclete is the one who is by your side to protect you. We ask ourselves, what does the paraclete protect us from? Well, first of all, he protects us from so many voices that we hear. <clears throat> when we hear certain comments that invite us to behave as everyone else does, to enjoy the present moment, to be disinterested in others, to think about oneself, then we feel a voice inside us that tells us that it's not like that, that those selfish speeches are death speeches, it is the Spirit that defends your life, the life of the Son of God, not the biological life. The life of the Son of God is that of love. The paraclete protects you from these voices that want to take you in ways that are not those of love and therefore are not paths of life. Or when you feel the voice of reasoning that tells you, the Beatitudes preached by Jesus are a dream. The kingdom of God is an unrealizable dream. Keep to yourself the new world because nobody will be able to build it. But the other voice tells us the world of brotherhood, world of mutual help, of respect for creation, of a different relationship with the goods of this world not considering yourself as owner but guests of God and therefore sharing with the brothers and sisters because at the end we must leave the reality of this world. We must take only what we need to live a life of children of God. This is the voice of the paraclete. The voice of the world tell us the kingdom will never be realized, it is better to resign yourself and live as everyone else does. Then we feel the voice that tells us that it is worth fighting to build a new world, this alternative society. That is the voice of the paraclete, the voice of the spirit. When someone leaves the reality of this world as if the biological life was the definite one, this person behaves accordingly. But we opted for a voice that tells us, keep in mind that biological life ends. This is the time when you should grow the Son of God that is in you, what characterizes you as a person. When we feel that voice that invites us to live for love, it is the Spirit. This text actually is very theologically dense, I know, but we are examining it in detail because this is the will, the testament of Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus continues, The Spirit will teach you everything. This teaching of the Spirit is that voice of which we have spoken until now. The Spirit is not a theoretic, theoretical teacher who presents a written law that we must study and that he explains. No, learning comes from our new heart, the new life that is in us 
when we receive, when we accept this gift of the divine life. It is the force that from within leads us to love. It is a new nature, and according to this nature, we behave like children of God, and we make of our life a gift of love. Think, for example, of the jasmine, that by its very nature emanates perfume. It cannot do otherwise. It does not receive an order from outside. It is from within, from its nature, that has that urge to emanate perfume. Or think of the vine itself. The vine produces grapes of its very nature, not because it receives orders from outside. The same happens to us. The Spirit instructs us from within. It is the nature of God's children that leads us to behave as Jesus did. A mother, before even becoming a mother, has that inner urge that leads her to behave like a mother. You do not need someone to give her an external order. Okay, a psychologist may help her understand her nature as a mother, but it is from within that the impulse comes to behave in a certain way with the creature that she brought into the world. And the same happens with Christians. The Spirit instructs us from within and tells us what we should do. Then love ceases to be a commandment. It becomes an internal demand, the demand of our new nature that is to be children of God. Then this Spirit reminds us everything Jesus, of what Jesus said. It does not add anything. Jesus already said everything with his life and with his word. He has shown us the perfect Son of God. What does the Spirit do? He continually reminds us of Jesus' life proposal. The Spirit does not add anything, but reminds us continuously. It reminds us of our identity as children of God. It is very easy to lose memory if uh, we do not pray for a week, we do not read an evangelical text, we do not listen to the voice of the Lord, we are just wrapped up in everyone's way of thinking, then we lose the memory of being children of God. This is an experience we all do. The Spirit keeps alive the memory of of our identity as children of God. And when we begin to think as everyone does, the Spirit reminds us of our identity. You cannot think like that because you are a child of God. Jesus continues saying, I leave you peace, not as the world gives it. We all know very well what is the peace of the world. Peace of the world is the interval between two wars. It ends as soon as the one who has won does not manage to keep subdued what has conquered, and then peace ends. Think of the Pax Romana that was maintained by, with the legion, legions, with oppression. Just think that they were free citizens and slaves. And the Roman peace consisted in maintaining the, that unjust situation. The free people oppressed the others. This is not the peace of Jesus. Jesus' peace is the peace of the new world, of the alternative society where all barriers are destroyed because everyone are children of the same father and they have to be attentive to the needs of the brothers and sisters and give what is necessary to build a good life for each of those we meet in our life. 
Jesus now continues, do not worry or be frightened. I am leaving, but I will be back. Jesus has mentioned that he's about to leave this world, but says, I am leaving, but I will return in a different way, but no less full than what they have experienced. It is the widening of Jesus' experience, existence, because he's leaving all the limitations that belong to the Incarnation by uh, becoming incarnate, but becoming one of us, the Son of God had all our limitations. Thus, he was in one place and not in another. He had the limit of space, the limit of time, the limit of ignorance, the limit of having to sleep, uh, of not being always available. These are all limits belonging to the Incarnation that the Son of God has assumed. All this is over, and for that reason now His presence expands. His present at all times, in every context, next to each one. That is why Jesus says, I am going, but I will come back. He comes back in a different way, as reason. Therefore, we should be happy about this. I, I know I have commented on a theologically very difficult text, but I wanted to present it because it reminds us of the gift of the Spirit that has been given to us. This new identity is that of the Son of God, and an identity that can manifest itself in our life as uh, manifested in Jesus, the full presence of the Spirit, of the divine life. When we join our life to that of Christ's love, the presence of His Spirit is fully manifested. I wish everyone a good Easter and a good week.